Welcome to Whiskey and Whitetail, the show for those that hunt with a passion and drink with a person, with a person or and, and with a purpose. And with a person. <laughs> person and a purpose. <laughs> As always, I'm your host, Gus. I'm Matt. And uh, thank you to our Waypoint Network, to the Waypoint Network for having us. Thank you to our Patreon for their support, our executive producers in that group. Thank you for all of you that support us, follow us, like our stuff, comment, share things with us. We always appreciate you. And uh, thank you to our sponsors. Matt, who are they? Uh, this week we got Vantage Point Archery, which we've talked about multiple times um i lost two in the woods the other day so i've got more on the way nice but their omega broadheads is that was what i wanted but they only have them in 200 grain right now so if you shoot 200 grains you should get over there and get the omega broadhead uh, pretty sick but if you don't the rest of their stuff is still good too we uh i'm a fan of the single bevel right for sure uh 125 grains what i've been shooting Definitely go check them out. It's made in America. It's a product we can stand behind. You know what I mean? And we Absolutely. actually do use them. It's not like uh, we were using them before they were a podcast sponsor. So. Yeah, it just so happened we 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 linked up with them. Got a lot in common. We we enjoy them as people, not just their company and not, not just their product. And it just it was a good fit. So yep, yep, yep. So check them out. You go to vparchery.com, and there's no promo codes because. Uh, they're great prices already. They're coming three packs. So all the prices you see there for three. Yep. Get them, check them out. If you haven't already, it's great stuff. Also, this episode is sponsored by Mint Mobile, which you can go to mintmobile.com slash whiskey. And uh, you can get started for as low as $15 a month. Right now they're doing a special for three months, $15 a month. So that would be $45 up front for three months of cell phone service, which is bananas. I made the switch probably a month and a half ago. Great stuff. Gus is yeah. thinking about it. Yeah, I'm thinking about it. I will tell you this. Make sure your phone is clean and clear because if you make a switch and AT&T or whoever still owns your phone, your IMEI, it'll be a couple of days and no cell phone service. I learned that lesson the hard way. <laughs> Which after calling their support, they said, hey, uh, we have all that information in the welcome startup guide. So I would recommend reading it. That. Yeah. <laughs> But yep, this is a good episode. We're we're going elk heavy. We're drinking. I, I I'm, I'm gonna pour some old elk bourbon. We're gonna talk about elk hunting because uh, we both were curious about it and um, specifically we east, some rabbit holes. Yeah, specifically eastern elk, uh, the the extinction of them and the restoration. So, yep. So it'd be a good episode. That's all I got. Stay tuned. I'm not gonna play music. I just wanted to. You should let it play for a while. I'd have just kept it in and let it uh let it be there. Right back up where I stopped. There you yeah. Go. Over to the Whiskey and White Tails podcast. <laughs> just jamming out today. Mm, mm, mm. I was like the song. I used it in a uh one of the YouTube videos we did. Yeah. It's very chill. Yeah. Chill. All right. Um I want to get into this bottle because I've been holding on to it for, I bought it in 2021. All right. So I've been waiting for the reason to open it and I just got one. And uh, I'm going to, I might do a partial review, but it's the old elk infinity blend. This is the 2021 version. So it says 60% old elk straight bourbon, but if you go and look it up, it's MGP. Okay. Which led me down a rabbit hole of the reason I'll probably never buy old elk again. And it's also blended with two different Kentucky straight bourbons. One is aged 11 years, one is aged 12 years, and this MGP product is aged six years. So I was going to get it. Making all the noise. Nice. Fresh bottle pop. <sighs> Oof. Yeah. And also, there was a time when we talked to them and they sent us this. That's right. I remember that. spout. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks. Hold it up. reminds me of that. It reminds me of the, there's a, that guy you sent me, you sent a, an Instagram video of the guy one time. I think he's in the Philippines or somewhere and he's always drinking some kind of different liquor from over and he pours a, a drink and then he always has like a jar of pickles and some sort of cured meat and yeah. he like slaps and slaps himself in the face and makes all these noises. <laughs> and then like, like does these elbow things to the, the jar and like the one video you sent me, I think he busted the jar with his elbow and pickles yeah. went everywhere. 
Yeah. And uh, I watch that guy all the time. And he, he's always pouring from some spout like that with like an elk or some red stag yeah. thing on it. It's funny as hell. They're pretty cool. It's probably the same one. It's a pretty nifty looking uh, spout. It yeah. has no practical use on my bar, but <laughs> it's been sitting there literally. When did they give us that? Three years ago? Yeah, it was at least three years ago. Mm. Well, you you got a bottle pop. I'm going to kill a bottle. So I don't know if we ever had an episode where we've popped a bottle and killed a bottle in the same episode. Oh, first well, time for with everything. the exception yeah. of... A George T. Stag episode that didn't get anywhere. <laughs> sure, we did pop and kill that bottle in one episode with Rocco. That was a great episode. That uh, I don't know that we put that out because it was no. That was a Patreon only uh, yeah. release. <laughs> that was a for, rough one for many reasons. Yeah, that was cool though. We made him a nice little box and we signed the bottle for him. And uh, yeah, yeah, that was he enjoyed fun. that. Yeah. So I get like uh, a good amount of oak and some uh, bananas. Mm. There's um almost like a I hate using that word, but coriander mixed it makes it with like a like a a very bland flour. But I think this is supposed to be like a malted throwback or something when ah, I was reading okay. about it. So that kind of makes sense. Well, I didn't even show the bottle, dude. This is, since we're talking going to be talking about elk in Kentucky, I grabbed cream of Kentucky. Nice. This is their, uh, their straight rye whiskey, the Bottle and Bond. It's it's been one of the f my favorite bottles that I've I've ever bought, and uh, I've had it for a year and a half almost now, and I've milked it for every little bit that it's worth. But good stuff. Yeah, great bottle. That's the bottle I told you to buy because he said if you don't buy it, I will. <laughs> Not bad. Um, I will say, on my researching of this, because I wanted to find this exact blurb. Uh, Plenty Ben is the first limited edition release from Old Elk with annual releases planned for the future, crafted by Greg Metz, which if you don't know, was the master of Stillard MGP Seagrams for a long time. Um, blah, blah, blah. So it's talking about like it was his master, whatever. So I was looking it up and I saw a, because you know, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm not like a Reddit guy, but usually if I'm looking to buy something, I'll look at Reddit. Yeah. Not necessarily whiskey, just like washer and dryer, whatever. Because you'll, you'll, the highest voted comment goes, you know, ranks higher. Sure. And so you can get a lot of good information on Reddit, believe it or not, if you stay out of like the community pages. Yeah. You just got to know, you got to know what, you, yeah, you got to know what to look for and you got to stay out of, yeah. you got to be able to identify political. some of those toxic right. pages. Some yeah. of them are just, yeah. So I wanted to read this because I found it interesting. And this is, uh, right. I'm going to go ahead and, as our lawyer advised us, allegedly. Okay. <laughs> One of my best friends worked for Old Elk for five years. He was there for the first bottling of the Dry Town Agenda and Vodka, the origination of Slow Cut Proofing, and all of the milestones that led to Old Elk's rise to prominence in the craft world. He told me himself that these blends are literally leftovers from various bottling runs, and the fact that they don't know what technically is in there spun as a savvy marketing rather than just pure laziness from a production standpoint, squeezing out profit. My buddy asked for a raise during the pandemic, and they sacked him with a pregnant wife at home along with the rest of the distillery crap staff good booze but a shitty company that would stab their workers in the back and call them leaving on a mutual decision chose me not to or choose to believe me or don't i don't really care but fuck this brand and then the very next comment says i believe you because they did the same thing to me and i met your friend spent the day drinking with him his co-worker and their head distiller in 2021 but he goes on to discuss that greg metz is in there for name alone mm -hmm. and uh Said he worked there for six months and he saw him for six total minutes. Wow! They never distill because they fired all the distillery, all the distillery staff. So it's just uh, just generic MGP barrels that they're pumping out. And uh, wow, in Greg's name. That's and wild. Well, if that's true, I wish I could say I'm surprised. I mean, as with any industry, nauseum uh, back in the day. Yeah, I mean, but as with any industry, you know, you have companies that are going to look uh, look out for their bottom line first. Unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And if that means getting rid of staff and finding a shorter way, quicker way to get a product out, um, you know, it's, man, it's unfortunate. It is unfortunate. I don't know if it's true. I'm not saying that it is, but um, there's, there's multiple comments under that. If people corroborating a story, Too bad. so I don't know, but for me, I know there's plenty of bourbon out there, so I haven't bought old oak in a long time. So I'm just going to continue to not buy it. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, that's all I needed to know. <laughs> Too much stuff out there. I don't need to be involved in controversy. 100%. Yeah. So, 
the elk thing. So you and I were, we went on an elk hunting trip. Um, we did. We've talked about before. And I think it left something in us where we're like, I it's actually, unfinished. I actually posted a picture on uh, Twitter today of uh, the the pack in, just the picture of the all the horses, you know, from, from where I was sitting. I think mm-hmm. you were behind me. And I was like, take me back. There's just something about it. And, I, you know, it's funny. The last couple of years, um, I've hunted. I've hunted whitetail. I still love hunting whitetail. Um, and I went last night. But ever since that trip, I there's been a little part of me that is just a little less excited when I go out in the woods. Um, it's hard to explain. It's like I still really love going out and hunting whitetail. I love being in the woods. I love everything about it. The prep you know, all the way through cleaning and cooking, everything in between. Um, but having experience what it's like to chase elk in the, in the mountains, um, it just, sometimes it just makes it, I'm not, I'm not going to lie, just a little bit boring. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I, so I, I love, uh, whitetail hunting. Um, and I would pick it over elk hunting just because I like, I like watching whitetail. I like the way they operate. Yeah. You know, I think that the, it requires a little more skill than average. And I'm saying that as a guy that's never killed an elk, but you're right. There's a, there's some times where I'm like, this would be a lot cooler if I knew <laughs> that I had to hike, you know, up the face of this mountain for what, you know, two miles or whatever we were doing. Right. Yeah. And then run through the woods and bugle and look for elk and, and watch out for bears. And then, and then sure. we got to hike all the way back down and we slept in that sulfur spring. So it just stunk like rotten eggs. <laughs> yeah, it did. Mice got into our coffee. Like, you know, that stuff was fun. We, I froze to death every night because I, I brought a mummy bag like an idiot. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, I, I guess it's unfair really to compare the two because they're, they're different. But it's, mm-hmm. just, it's just after you, ex, you experience the excitement and the, um, the grind of being in the mountains and, and chasing after elk, um, especially coming, coming back, you know, admittedly unsuccessful, it just leaves kind of a just leaves a taste in your mouth and has this, this desire to get out there and, and do it again. Um, <clears throat> and like I said, I, I enjoy why I, I, I think if I had to choose one or the other to do forever, the rest of my life, I would, I would choose whitetail hunting. Um, yeah. but uh, there's still something about chasing elk in the mountains and in the hills and finding out through this research that we did, um, that it is way closer and more accessible than I thought it was, is very exciting. hundred <laughs> percent, dude. I, I told, I texted you. So we, we had discussed that we wanted to do a topic this episode. And I was like, well, I'm, let's talk about elk. Cause yeah. I, I, we're both passionate about, um, hunting. And, um, and again, that, that I just feel like we, we left the elk woods on un, unfinished business. Yeah. There, we still got stuff we need to do. So the, the research was interesting. I don't know how much, I have a little bit of background on Eastern elk. I don't know if you have that. Um, we did, yeah, did a little bit as well. Yeah. Just, just the, the, the Eastern elk in, in sense of not, not elk that's located in the Eastern part of the United States, but the subspecies that no longer exists. Right. So they lived in the Northern and Eastern U S and Southern Canada. And, uh, there's actually prehistoric evidence showing that these Eastern elk, uh, were around 2,500 years ago and it shows them pretty much everywhere, including Alabama and Delaware which was two of the states that it, it like was like, this is odd that there were elk in Alabama. Um, but they were extirpated, which, which to distinguish that between extinct, extinct means they're gone. Extirpated means they're no longer in that area. So in 1737, they were extirpated from South Carolina um, until 2016. So there was a North Carolina elk spotted in South Carolina in 2016. And these Eastern elk could grow to be up to a thousand pounds and stand 50 to six inches tall. But what I found most fascinating is they had six foot antler racks. Damn. So while they're 60 inches tall, which is five feet, they got six feet of rack on top of that. That's wild, man. That is a big animal. Blows my mind. <laughs> Cause you know, regular elk aren't, 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 aren't like that. But the, yeah, that's uh, wild. <clears throat> Another thing I wrote about that was the European settlers arrived here in the United uh, world, well, North America, and by the mid 1800s, elk were pretty much gone. So naturalist James Audubon reported in 1851, a few elk could be found in the Allegheny Mountains in West Virginia, but they were virtually gone from the rest of the range. The last wild eastern elk was killed in Pennsylvania in 1877 and de- declared officially extinct in 1880. Yeah. I don't know if you had anything else for the background on no, Eastern just that, elk, um, right? yeah, no, I think, uh, I think the lot, like you said, the last one was killed, uh, like right before 
um, the Civil War. So for those that are better with I, my brain, I, I tie uh, events in history to time frames better than I do just picking a date or telling me a date. So it's right before the Civil War. Um, and yeah, so I mean, they they covered, like you said, uh, like in the United States, you would have found them in the the states that we consider the midwest like the dakotas and minnesota up in michigan um all the way to the northern states and then down into the carolinas tennessee georgia um in areas right now that you would not even consider or believe that yeah. would would reside but they were they were there and then as eastern um or as as settlers came from overseas and, and settled the united states they just they just basically hunted them to extinction. Um, they ate them all. They ate them all. They were those people that were living and, and, and coming and settling here were in survival mode. And elk did not run from huge, similar to the way they do now. If you stand still enough, an elk will walk right up to you. Mm -hmm. So they were easy to kill. Um, so it yields a lot of meat. Um, and in, in many cases, they were destroying crops. So it was a double edged sword from the elk's perspective. They couldn't really win for losing if they were staying away for humans and sneaking in to try and get, uh, you know, some food from a crop, they were pissing everybody off. And if they were standing around and, 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 and not running from humans, they were too easy of a target. So, um, it just kind of presented a, a, a perfect, I guess, a, a perfect scenario for them to unfortunately be hunted to extinction, which is nothing, um, new that to, yeah. to, to the North America and, and what settlers did, you know, as Western, if you, if you do some research and there's some books, um, I can't, I, I was listening to someone talk about one the other day and I cannot remember the name of it. Uh, it's, I think it's called the, the journal of a, the journal of a trapper or journal of a trapper. Oh I forget, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> I have who, that book somewhere. I forget who wrote it, but he details basically what it was like to be a trapper and an expansion like in, in, in the West. And um, like we hunted the Buffalo almost to extinction. You know, we, we, we decimated um, populations of, of elk out there, beaver, anything that could yield a pelt or something valuable. We just yeah. hunted it to death. And uh, it's, um, some researchers have, have said that they have, they have looked everywhere else in the world to try to identify points in history in which another civilization or another group of individuals or peoples have settled an area over a course of time and had such a negative impact on wildlife and they cannot find any evidence of anything as detrimental to wildlife as that period of time in the United States. And it's really sad when you think about it. Yeah. I know that there was um, some of the, to put that in perspective, some of the early movements into Australia, because the, there was a lot of different animals that lived there that went extinct and they, they linked it right to the time that the humans showed up. Because basically for hunting, they would just burn the forest down. Jeez. And that's why a lot of that stuff is, is barren wasteland because it used to be a thriving you know, I don't know, tropical area. Yeah. But they would just burn the woods down and kill all the animals on the other side of it. And, and it caused a huge distinction. But for anyone that wanted to know, it's called Journal of a Trapper, Nine Years in the Rocky Mountains Yeah, by it. Osborne Russell. I have the book somewhere. Osborne, that's it. Yep. They kept referring to Osborne and I thought it was the guy's last name. And it took yeah. me forever to realize that that was actually his first name. Uh, but, to give you, but to give you a, like a number of pers perspective of how many elk, of this Eastern elk, we, we, we drove to extinction. Um, at the time of, of settlement in, in the United States, uh, Eastern elk were uh, one of six subspecies that like we mentioned earlier. And uh, Ernest Thompson Seton estimated that uh, a third of the 10 million elk found in pre-settlement America were Eastern elk, a third wow. of 10 million. And we hunted them to extinction. That's a lot of, that's a lot of fucking elk, man. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of jealous. Yeah. But they were probably also eating it for every meal every day. And, right. Uh, I mean, you, yeah. there was there weren't cattle farms yet. There, right. You know, there weren't. You know, you couldn't go to the grocery store and grab stuff. So yeah, it's fair to say we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the elk population. Very true. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. So we there's the, kind of some background on it, but the whole point of this episode is we wanted to tell you where you can elk hunt in the eastern United States, and so that's the rest of this podcast will be kind of geared towards that. Um, and I think there's four main states: Pennsylvania. North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, and then there's states where there's overflow. Right. But I believe those are the four main places that they're beginning to bring the elk population. And I don't mean beginning. They're, they've been doing it for a long time. Yeah. Um, this elk species, the Manitoban species of elk subspecies, um, this is a Midwest, specifically like North Dakota area, obviously Manitoba, Canada. 
but they're a larger body size than what we had here at the Eastern Elk, but it was significantly smaller antlers. They don't have six foot racks on top of them. But I, we we're going to start with North Carolina because that kind of leads around and then we'll go up to Pennsylvania, which is, I don't know much about Kentucky because you did the Kentucky side, but yep, yep. Uh, Pennsylvania is fascinating. Cool. So in North Carolina, 2001, 2002, the National Park Service reintroduced 52 elk into the Cataloochee area of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, that's one hour west of Asheville. If you look on a map, it's kind of midway between Knoxville and Asheville uh, near the Cherokee National Forest, which anyone that's grew up in that area knows where that is. Um, some have wandered outside of those parks and boundaries established ranges, but the majority of them are pretty much still there. And the National Park Service was responsible for managing the elk on that property beginning in 2008. And once the reintroduction was deemed a success, the responsibility for elk management outside of park boundaries was transferred to the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. And currently that Wildlife Commission estimates there's 150 to 200 elk residing in North Carolina on both public, private, and Great Smoky National Park land. Um, the population is not a level that's hunting would be allowed due to right. the management objectives that they have. So you cannot hunt elk in North Carolina, mm -hmm. but if you want to see them, you can go to the Akanalufti, Akanalufti. I don't know. It's in the Cataloochee Valley. <laughs> it's a visitor center and there's yeah. fields out front and there's actually live cameras online that you can look it up and look at these fields and see the elk out there. But lots of people go and hang out and watch these elk walk around, which I, I would love to do next time I go through Asheville. Yeah. I didn't know that was a thing, but I um, didn't either. It's uh, one of the things that, that my research on Tennessee, because I touched on Tennessee as well, um, the, the elk being there are a huge, have a huge economic impact by drawing visitors to come look and see. Um, mm -hmm. I'll jump ahead a little bit, but in 2017, Tennessee estimated the total economic value of the elk was $10.25 million. That's based on wow. all the money spent and accrued by bringing visitors into the state um, as a part of that. So valuable, you know, valuable wildlife for sure. But um, the the management in North Carolina is it's interesting. It's actually the management of the and the oversight of the elk population there is, is actually split between the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Agency and the Eastern Band of Cherokee Nation, depending on where where those those elk have sort of migrated and drifted off into, right. um, so they manage them together and they cooperate and all that stuff. Um, and they wanted to bring more in. I don't know if you saw this on your on, on your um, in your research, but it, you know, you and I have talked about where um, where we hunt in North Carolina sometimes uh, up in that area of the state where uh, CWD has started to rise its head and, and show um, should kind of show its ugly face there. Well, in 2012, um, like you said, the the elk herd was estimated to be around 150 to 200. That was as far back as 2012. They wanted to bring more in. But because of CWD, they they've stopped and bringing yeah. any more in, um, which kind of sucks. But um, you know, hopefully, hopefully it doesn't have a negative impact on them, and, and it'll, it'll continue to grow. I'm hoping that they grow and we can one day hunt them. But I don't think what those numbers will ever be. No, not when you see the not when you see those numbers compared to the numbers in the states where you can't hunt. Right. Yeah. Um, and then that's pretty much the same story as far as Tennessee goes. There's just there's some elk. In the eastern part of Tennessee, they're just overflow of that. Do you, in your research of Kentucky, did you see if any are bleeding into Tennessee from Kentucky? Um, I didn't see that specifically, but they are uh, the zones. The, the zone includes uh, sixteen counties, so I would not be surprised if if there are trickles of them, you know, coming down into Tennessee from Kentucky. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's go in. Can you hunt Kentucky first and foremost? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, nice. Yeah. So. Uh, just a little bit of history on the reintroduction of, of, of elk into Kentucky. Um, some of the stuff I was reading. So obviously we discussed, you know, elk, elk were extinct, you know, almost 200 years ago from that area. So in 1997, um, they released elk that they had snatched and kind of gathered up, captured from Western States um, and Canada. And they released uh, over the course of a couple of years, starting in 1997, uh, 1500 elk into the wow. eastern part of of, of Kentucky. Um, it, it it became an area where the, the elk population thrived really, really well. As you and I know, as you've seen, uh, anyone who's been to the eastern part of, of Kentucky in the mountains there, populations of those areas are very small. So very minimal human interaction. And with the milder winters and warmer weather, it just, you know, in the thick, dense forest, especially like you see in um, some of the national forest up there, 
it's just perfect, perfect um, habitat for them to thrive. Um, and they've done so really well. So you can hunt in, like I said, 16 different counties. Um, those counties include Bell. I'm going to, I'm going to murder some of these names. <laughs> uh, Braithit, Clay, Floyd, Harlan, Johnson, Knox, Knox, Harlan. Knox Leslie, Letcher, Magafin. That's a fun name. Martin, McCreary, Perry, Pike, and Whitley counties. Um, and actually to answer your question earlier, it said originally the area, it says originally the area included 14 counties, but Whitley and Mercury counties were added in 2004 to bridge Kentucky and Tennessee's respective restoration zones. So ah, my go. guess is that there, there is some crossover there between the two. Um, watch, watch Tennessee, like in 50 years, be the elk hunting <laughs> capital of the world. Right. Yeah. Um, the latest, the latest information that I was able to find um, in, in my search and, and, you know, I, I'm not a professional researcher, so there may be more recent information, but as of a 2021 report that was put out, um, it is estimated that there is around or more than 10,000 elk in Kentucky. It's wow. difficult though, to, to get an accurate number because of how thick uh, the forest is there and researchers just don't have the ability to get out there and, and actually get, you know, super accurate numbers. Um, in 2021, they handed out 594 permits or tags to hunt um those are done mostly by a randomized drawing um and the only thing is is if you do when you do if you do finally pull a tag you cannot submit for another one for three years wow yeah i didn't get any information on pricing um but i'm sure you can find that on kentucky's is it did you see anything if it's fair between non-resident resident and hunters um so there is there is a a i believe a partial sort of um you know preference given to to residents yeah is that so when they give the tags out i don't know how far you went into that but is it like any county how many days do you get did you find anything I, on that i didn't i didn't look that deep into it no yeah. um i can certainly do that though if, if people are interested i'd be happy to to go deeper and and we could put that in a, a blog post on the website <clears throat> yeah we'll do that we'll do a blog post and put all this information in there and uh that way you'll be able to find it yeah i find that fascinating I, would you rather hunt elk in kentucky or colorado uh well kentucky is an eight hour drive as opposed to <laughs> a 24 hour drive so yeah yeah, yeah. How about that <laughs> yeah we'll have to see let's see how far it is to um like here to pittsburgh yeah, what i wouldn't mind pennsylvania either it's also shorter so let's see it's uh drive <clears throat> and if you're listening and you've had the opportunity to hunt 10 hours and hunt elk in kentucky or pennsylvania or tennessee well probably not tennessee but if you've been able to hunt in um in, Kent in Kentucky or Pennsylvania, you've hunted elk and you'd like to come on and talk about it. We would love to have you on and, and yeah. what you have to say. Do a part two thing. Yeah, for Do you sure. Do anything else on Kentucky? I don't want to jump straight to Pennsylvania, but. No, 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 that, that was pretty much it. I was fascinated by the amount of effort they went into to capture, um, you know, 1500 elk and they, they yeah. captured them in various ways. They tagged a lot of them, uh, collared them and have kept pretty close tabs on, on quite a few of them. Um, and then I, I was able to find a YouTube video that shows them releasing them from, uh, cattle trailers and just taking off into the, into the Hills. And they had like huge crowd of people like 200 yards away watching. It was pretty cool. Wow. Well, they did a little bit different in Pennsylvania and I went really deep in the woods on this. Um, as I texted you and was like, Hey, we need to go. Elk. <laughs> well, we need to put in for tags for Pennsylvania, which I'll get to, I'll get to that. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. Know, straight through we'll we'll discuss but so from 1913 to 1926 the pennsylvania game commission released 177 elk from yellowstone wyoming oh, nice. okay in 10 counties and today it is more than 800 and their range is approximately 800 square miles so these elk that they brought um half of them went to clinton county and the other went to clearfield county or came from excuse me clinton county Clearfield from wyoming how much do you think these elk cost each? This is uh, like, again, this is 1913. I don't know. So Pennsylvania had to buy them or some organization had to buy them from, from Yellowstone. It, it wasn't, it just said, this is what each elk costs um, to bring it there. And, oh, okay. And okay. Like hell, I don't know, man. 5,000 a piece, $30, 30 bucks. Damn. Yeah. I thought it was gonna be a whole lot more. <laughs> I wish that I was there in 1913. I would have bought a few myself. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know what $30 was in 1913. I'm guessing it was probably a grand but maybe not a grand probably like 500 bucks i don't know you could buy a car back then for like eight dollars i think God. i'm just kidding i don't know. i have no idea from what what year 1913 yeah 1913 to 1926 so that'd be yeah it'd be like a thousand dollars today oh it's not bad 
I paid a thousand dollars for that's cheap. Yeah, for a year's worth of, of meat, yeah. probably a year plus. Hell yeah, a year plus. Yeah. <laughs> so to ensure their successful reintroduction, the General Assembly enacted a law to protect them until November fifteenth, nineteen twenty one, where they would do a two week elk season, and it would be requiring bulls with at least four points on one antler. So the release and all that did not go as planned, but they loaded these elk into trains and shipped them to Pennsylvania. And when they got to Pennsylvania on the trains, they literally just shoot them out of the cars into the wild. Um, and so they began to wander and search for cover, which the article went pretty deep in this, like cover unfamiliar land, unfamiliar food sources, don't know where the water is, don't know where anything is. Um, and it looked like it wasn't going to be good. So it, it wasn't as great, but within a week, some have traveled up to 40 miles away from their release sites. Wow. Which is insane. So in 1915, barely two years after the first elk were released, the game commission bought Another 95 elk to be released in six different counties. Um, so they still didn't do the hunt because they just it, it wasn't taking well. Yeah. But it caused a lot of problems with farmers. And, and so what, one thing I've noticed about hunting in general is you start pissing off farmers. Yeah. Tags go up. Everything starts to become like hunting becomes different. I mean, here, like around the peanut fields, they absolutely waste deer. Like at oh, yeah. night, they just shoot them and they throw them in a pot. Yeah, the um, the agricultural uh, depredation tags you can get. Yeah. yeah, yeah. From the DNR will give you like I think it's thirty at a time. Now yeah. the, the the only thing is, and this is what you're supposed to do, and and I don't know how if everybody follows this rule, but if you shoot deer, and this, it drives me crazy that this is this is the way it is. But yeah. if you shoot deer as part of a depredation program. You are not supposed to pick them up. You're not supposed to take them in, clean them. You're supposed to leave them there. Yep. Which kills me. Like you could, like how is how is killing, I don't know, five or six deer deer in a night (laughs) around a farm, a field, and just leaving them there? How is that? I I don't, I don't understand how that's that's good for the environment or for or for the for the population when it could be going to at least taking it to a to a processor to be donated to a shelter or something. Or to me. I mean, I'll take it. Yeah. No kidding. Right. But yeah, it's, so the farmers are reporting that the corn crops, they brought them down to two inches off the ground. And so a lot of farmers started to illegally kill them and they were poached a lot um, because they were, they thrived. So once that happened, they had an actual first elk season, which was held in 1923, two years after when they were supposed to. Uh, during that first season, hunters killed 23 legal bulls. Over the next three years, 25 more were taken. In 1927 alone, hunters took 26 bulls, making it the state's best harvest since reintroduction. And that was pretty much the high watermark until modern times Mm. um, because the World War started. So, you know, elk conservation kind of went out the window. Everybody was working on the war effort. Yeah. Um, But in 1930, the bull elk harvest dropped to five. And the following year, only one bull was taken. And that was the last of the Pennsylvania elk hunting seasons. Um, so until after the wars through the seventies, blah, blah, blah. So instead of going through everything they did from 1970 until 2000, I'll just leave that as a mystery or you can go look it up yourself, but this is where it starts to get really cool. So in 2000, the general assembly enacted act 111, which created an elk hunting license and fees and procedures for applying for elk tags. In April of 21, they started a lottery of sorts. So in their first year, there was more than 50,000 people submitted applications. For the first elk hunt in over 70 years, they selected 30. Wow. Out of those 30 people, 27 of them shot elk. Wow. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. So Pennsylvania's continued that since 2001. They annually draw about 20,000 applications. Good Lord. So today, uh, that's probably not the right answer. 20,000. Oh, the annual drawing has about 20,000 applications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I, I thought that's what you meant. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, that's what I meant. That's what I said. <laughs> so today they say there's 1,400 elk that freely roam around 3,000 square miles in the north central region of the state, um, mostly within these certain counties, Elk, Cameroon, Clinton, Clearfield, and Center counties. And to get into, that's the end of like the thing. So here's how you elk hunt in Pennsylvania which has gotten me really excited. So this year's elk application period was from February 1st to July 16th. The drawing put, took place on July 29th. Okay. This year's season, archery, is September 16th through the 30th. The general wow. season is October 30th through November 4th, so five days. Whoa. And the late season is December 30th through January 6th, which is seven days. 
So last year, they gave out 60 antlered tags. 55 were harvested. What? Yeah. They gave so out 100. Go ahead. Well, so so are, there, are the elk just really densely populated in a few areas? Seems that way. Man, that is that that was some great odds. 60 tags, five people did not get it. So I would bet you. Those five at least didn't make it three out. Three of them didn't go. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. So out of 118 antler list tags, 76 were harvested. Wow, man, that is impressive. So I'm going to give you the overall total since 2010. Okay. Since 2010, there has been 388 antlered tags. 375 were filled. Fuck off. That's no 92% success rate. That is wild. Yeah. Way better than Antler list, 1,131 antler list tags, 856 were filled, 76%. So your overall odds of killing an elk in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. the tag, is 82% chance. That's pretty solid. And guess what? It gets better. No way. The but wait, there's state, more. Yeah, but wait, there's more. The out-of-state cost. So you and I, <sighs> yeah. next year, we'll buy a tag, hopefully. I'm going to do it. Yeah. I won't eat McDonald's for a little bit. $351.97 all included. Yeah. That's about what it was for, if you remember, Colorado. Yeah. Being out of state, you know, non-resident, and then for an either sex over-the-counter tag, it was around, it was like 300 some bucks after tax. I, think the, I didn't write down the residential tag. Sorry for the Pennsylvania people, but I think it was like $25. Damn. Non-resident is 250 Yeah. Yeah. Come on but in. That's still a great price. Yeah, hell yeah, it is. So if you don't get it, and also their lotteries are fair. They don't care where you're applying from. They nice. all go into one bucket. Yeah, yeah, The winners yeah. are pulled. But yeah, completely blew my mind. I had no idea the success rate was that high, and it was that cheap. Yeah, so I'm going to add that to my list of things to apply to every year. Yeah, I'm going to apply to it every year. I think what I'm going to do is leave the hunt club, and I'm going to take that Whatever it is, eleven $1 hundred dollars a year. And I'm going to use that to towards tags. tags. Yeah, it's a good idea. And that's a hundred percent going to be one of them. I mean, if you think about it, it's probably going to take us five years. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe longer. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not though. Yeah, it's, it's the luck of the draw. But you get a preference point if you don't win. So. Yeah. Hell yeah. And even if you know you can't make those seasons, you can just buy a preference point, and it doesn't cost you that much money. Right. You know, I've been thinking about different approaches to hunting. I love being able to just you know decide. You know, I'm going to go go tonight right like we get off here it's 4 19 it's probably a little late now but if we had recorded earlier we got done i could just be like you know what I, i'm gonna go sit tonight and grab my bag and just zip up you know 45 minutes up the road and be in a stand but if i take all the times out of the year that i do that combined with the the couple weekends that i take to hunt maybe a couple days in a row and look at total number of days and let's say it's it's 15 total days or 20 total days that i actually sit in a tree if i were to take and just pick three or four locations to go hunt for a solid week somewhere yeah. you know a week in a week in kentucky or two weeks in kentucky a week in north carolina a week in francis marion or wherever and, and and take those 20 days and condense them into three or four really focused hunts i think it might be more fun and we might have more success maybe i don't know it's um it's i plan to, to hunt way more than that this year you know we have we oh have, yeah me too we both haven't hunted a lot in the past two years because we've been focused on the whiskey side of things. But now that we've done everything we wanted to do in the whiskey world, um, we have no reason. Like the Bourbon Festival was last weekend, and uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I posted a <laughs> yeah, did a awesome. story like nowhere I'd rather be, including a Bourbon Festival. <laughs> not not saying it didn't look like a lot of fun. You know, we know a lot of people that were there, and it, yeah, yeah, they had a great time for but, sure. Um, I'd much rather be hunting this for year. sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I plan to spend a lot of time hunting, especially now that I have something that's really close. Yeah, really close. Yeah, I would. I'd be in the same. I'd be in the same boat. Yeah, I can. I can be home thirty minutes after sunset if I don't see anything. Yeah, that's great. Which I hunted Monday night, mm -hmm. and um, just saw ten deer Monday night. Nice. They were all does and fawns, but still seeing deer, man. Yeah, it's probably more deer in that one sit than you saw all the last two years at the club. Well. It's no secret. I haven't killed a buck in two years. So, <laughs> I, I think I, I don't think I killed anything last year. 
No, I don't think you did. I don't remember. I know I didn't because my freezer has no deer meat in it, and it has it in quite some time. That's fair. Yeah, I'm gonna stock up this year though. It's a hundred percent gonna happen. Yeah, my I I intend to have the problem of needing to buy a freezer this year. I have a second More. fridge in the garage, but I I intend to have to buy a, a second full stand up freezer. Did you get rid of uh, that medical fridge, <laughs> Dexter? Dexter. Yeah, I got rid of that thing. Oh, did you? Well, it was a mistake, but whatever. <laughs> did you get money for it? Yeah, got like eight hundred dollars for it. What? That's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, actually, I got the guy. The guy, uh, it was free. <laughs> I know. The guy that bought the guy that bought it was a uh, a farmer. Yeah, he has a little one of those like yeah, you pick it farms where you come and pick berries or whatever. You know, they grow a bunch of different things, yeah. and uh, they needed it to store blueberries and berries uh, after they had been picked in their little shop area. So it went to a good place, I guess. But it made a hell of a beer fridge. I think about that fridge sometimes when I when you mention Gabe. I think about that fridge when I was walking inside and I guess he had said something to me and I didn't hear him. Oh, I don't remember. And then he was like, he said, uh, you told me the story when I got back outside, but he was like, okay, fuck me then. Cause Oh yeah. Oh, you know, that's his favorite thing to say. He he likes to say, Oh, 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 fuck me. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And then you were like, he can't hear. Yeah. And then you, and then he well, was just like, funny because he can't, hear I can't either. hear either. Yeah. And so we became friends right <laughs> yeah. then just, yeah. just not because we can't hear. Yep. That was great. I that think about funny. that every time you mention his name. Yep. Yeah. yeah that's, that's funny. I just talked to him the other day. Yeah. What about? Yeah. Just some things. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, if all goes well, I'd be talking to him too. <clears throat> yeah, it's true. Oh, excuse me. Big facts. Um, but yeah. so, yeah. So in terms of, uh, elk. I didn't get any information on applying in Kentucky, but um, if 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 the cost in the if there's if I was wrong on the preference to to um, in state residents, yeah, I, I'd say we should apply to both. I agree with you. We'll have to look into that. We'll do it for the article. Um, I already have all my stuff, but you can look into it for the article. Yeah, whatever. And then we'll we'll throw it in there. Yeah, it's um, I don't know. I found it fascinating. It's like. I had, if I had no, I didn't know that. And I would guess that a lot of people don't know that. And if you've never chased elk before, it's something that uh, all of us, uh, all the Southern boys are like, one day we'll get out right. there. And, you know, and we know ne- you never do it. And so Gus and I, we almost canceled our elk trip several times. And, and I remember we both just said, if we don't do this now, we're never going to do it. Yep. And that's true. Cause we never would have, if we hadn't done it then. No, I mean, the, the, whenever you're planning a big trip like that, it seems like life will throw every possible thing in your way to give you an excuse to not do it. Yeah. Things start to get expensive. Stuff comes up with the family or with the kids. <clears throat> and you I had just to go gotta, buy a new truck. Yeah, that's right. You had transmission problems with that other one, <laughs> and you had to get another truck. Yeah, My, my old truck was certainly not going to make it. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, in retrospect, it, you know, it is what it is. But, yeah, there's every, every excuse you can think of to not do it will we'll rear its ugly head, and you just have to, to decide – no matter what, you're going to do this thing. You're going to make um, it happen. And it makes me wonder, like hunting elk in, in Kentucky or Pennsylvania, it makes me wonder if guys from out west that hunt elk regularly are like, nah. You know, not, and so so it's, know. so they don't bother coming out there. And so maybe it's just, maybe, you know, the Mississippi River is too big for them to cross. They can't swim or something. I don't know. They, um, I, know. <clears throat> I know that it, like when, like for instance, like guys we know here, when they mm-hmm. go kill an elk, and you see, and they send you a picture, like Doug, like yeah. Doug killed another elk, like uh, two weeks ago or something. Did he? Man, he's a slaying machine. Yeah, that's two in a row. And uh, but it's like you see him on Instagram, like out in the mountains in Colorado, elk hunting, and it's like, dude, he lives three miles away. Right. But there he is, and you know, it's it's just so wild for in South Carolina to know someone that goes elk hunting. That's that's I, not like some rich asshole that just yeah haunts all the time. I will say this that. The barrier to entry, and I'm not going to say when, if, or I'm not going to say if, when, when we choose to do it again, will be much lower. We have yeah, pretty we much have all, of the, all the equipment now and, and gear that we need in terms of like solid rain gear, all that kind of stuff. You know, there were investments in things that you know, we were going to the mountains. We were going to have contact with nobody for, for many days at a time. So we had to invest in, in a really good rain system, really good equipment, things like that. Um, we have all most of that stuff now. So other than tags and travel, there would be no, really no, nothing to spend money on. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to do one of these seven day hunts, like we, I mean, there was no cell phone service. So we, we bought a spot device, which 
really was just for a family. Cause if you get hurt out there, you're like, if it's bad enough that you need to use a spot device, like you'll be dead before they get there. But, um, it was really just so we could let the family know that we were alive yeah. and you had never done that before. Like I had been to Afghanistan, so I know what it's like to not be able to talk to anyone. I mean, you've been to yeah. Djibouti, but you still had access. Yeah. I could still make a phone call once yeah. a day or every other day for 10 minutes or so. It wasn't so, a big deal. But how did it make you feel being out there? You were like, you know, so the first, so like I actually had this conversation, uh, we were talking, I was talking to Jessica and I don't remember what we were talking about. Um, we were talking to Gavin too uh, about being gone for that long and she hated it. Like absolutely sure. hated it. Um, and, and I was like, well, if we ever do that again, you know, we'll probably invest in the, the, the next step up of the, the sat devices phone. that allows you to, it's basically a sat phone. It allows you to at least yeah. text or make a phone call. We well, can use sat phones now. Yeah. And so you don't need to use it every day. You can just use it to check in. Hey, quick phone call. Everything's good. But it also gives her the comfort of knowing if some, something really bad happens with the kids or something at home that she can get in contact with me. Um, And she knew that where we were, even if something happened, uh, even if she could get a hold of me immediately, it was going to be 48 hours (laughs) before I could even get home at at best. Right. Cause it's going to take at least 24 hours to get out of there. Um, but yeah, man, it was different. I've never, um, you know, of course it was fun being out there and, and, and being away from everything disconnected from the world. Um, you know, but like not knowing what's going on with, the, with my kids, not going, you know, make, yeah. you know, and if Jessica's okay, or, you know, I knew that she wasn't going to bother me if there was something minor going on, but even something minor, like one of the kids hurting themselves, like, I'd want to know what's going on. So, uh, well, there's no to, way she could tell you, right. There's no way I gave her a, a number to contact with the outfitter, but you know, she understood that if something happened and she contacted that outfitter to get a hold of me so I could get home that that was going to be a 24 to 48 hour process before I could yeah. probably even get on the road. And, yeah. um, you know, that that's hard for someone, you know, I can, so I, I, you know, props to military spouses and families that, you know, deal with that stuff on a regular basis. That's that I was a military brat. I know it sucks going along periods of time, but being, uh, you know, sort of the head of a household and being in charge yeah. of a family and being in that position is a lot different. And so it makes Way me different. really think about like what your, your dad, and my dad had to deal with when they were gone in a way, um, and then trying to function at a high level and do a job. Um, we were just fucking off in the mountains, having fun at the end of the yeah. day, but like right. ha- having to focus and turn, turn that side of your brain off entirely. So you can focus on a job is it's a whole other world entirely. So, um, yeah, it was tough, man, but it was, it was still a lot of fun. Uh, I think we'd do it a little bit differently. I think if we were to go again, um, as much fun as it was having a base camp, I think I would like to pack Ooh. a small bivy camp, a, a, like a bivy and be able to just hop around or even just like hundred percent hit a trailhead and go down for a day or two, head back, get in the vehicle, go to the other side of the unit and be able to move around. Um, 100%. Don't want to be stuck in a, in a bowl. Like I hated being stuck. Yeah. It's it's because it's just like, you just felt like you could hear where they were and to get them to come down. I mean, we got, we got a couple to come down, but it's, yeah. you know, yeah, hundred percent. I'd much rather have everything packed up that you just go and the resupplies are in the truck. You get out yep. to the truck and all your stuff's in there. So you just leave, you pack like two days worth of food go out, do two days, come back. And, um, yeah, I, I would definitely, if we do that in Pennsylvania, that's hundred percent the way we're going to do it. Yeah. So the other thing too, was coming back, like you only did seven days away from people, but do you remember when we went to McDonald's? Dude, let me tell you something. <laughs> so there, there are two, there are two times in my life where I, where I will tell you that, um, shitty food has been the most unbelievable thing I've ever had. The first was after being on the Appalachian Trail for seven days and only having like freeze dried meals and water. We got um, we got to a trailhead and we hitchhiked. Only time I ever hitchhiked in my life. Hitchhiked a ride in the back of a truck into a little town to this little this little place called the blue uh, the blueberry the blueberry hostel the blueberry patch. It's a legit blueberry blueberry patch farm, and um, you can camp outside or if they're open and it's during season you can stay in like a little hostel area. And it was off season, so they weren't open, but they left the building open. You could go in, help yourself to some snacks, and leave a tip. That Coca Cola, full <laughs> sugar Coke, was the best Coke I have ever, to this day. I can close my eyes and think about how that tasted. It was unbelievable. Best thing I've ever yeah. had. Um, one of the best beers I've ever had was a couple of days before that um, on the Appalachian Trail or, or any long trail. Uh, they have what are called referred to as uh, trail ferries, and these are people that will just do like day hikes off of trailheads and they'll leave little snacks and drinks for through hikers and, um, or section hikers, which is what we were doing. We were just doing a long section and someone had left two banquet Coors beers in a Creek, a little, a little stream. It was the coldest beer I've ever had. And to this day, it is why 
Coors Banquet beer is my favorite, <laughs> just like commercial beer. Um, it's so good. But yeah, coming in after, and, and we got to the McDonald's. First of all, we must have looked like, I don't know. I don't know. We were like, I don't know. Uh, convicts uh, week, that were escaping. A week without shower. <laughs> a week without a shower or anything. We're still in full cam when we walk in. And all kinds of stairs. It was Sunday. So people were like in their, this tiny town, like Sunday best for Sunday breakfast at McDonald's. Yeah. And I think I ordered like a Big Mac, a large drink, fries. I also ordered a McGriddle. Like it was like one of everything, please. And uh, we just sat there in silence and just didn't talk for 10 minutes. We just shoved food in our face. It was the best McDonald's I've ever had in my life. But do you remember how awkward it was that you were like, I don't like these people being yes, around me? Yes, that. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it was weird because I didn't expect I didn't expect to feel that way. Uh, but if there's if if that is in any way a microcosm of what you guys experience when you come back from de yeah. deployment and you get off of the plane with guys you just spent seven months with going through shit, experiencing shit, and you step off a plane right into dealing with BWI. Yeah, yeah, right into where I flew into ungrateful, <laughs> privileged, just yeah. people who just don't give a shit and aren't grateful for all the shit that they have. You're just like, who the fuck are these people? I, I, can, I, totally, I can totally understand it. And they they had left our lock. So all the weapons when we flew home, because I flew home on like a regular airliner. I flew from Afghanistan to Kuwait and then Kuwait like a regular airliner to Germany. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember being in Germany. They gave us like sleeping drugs. But when we landed at BWI, they had left the key to unlock where all our weapons were, they left the key in Germany. And so like, we can't leave our weapons there, you know, they're military weapons. So they had to go get a locksmith to come in. I think it was like three in the morning and pick this lock on the airplane so we could get our weapons out. So we're piled up where the taxi cabs come. Mm -hmm. All of us fresh out, fresh home from Afghanistan, all our gear piled up on the street, just standing there pissed off. Cause it's three in the morning and like, our wives are waiting for us at the at the battalion headquarters and all this stuff. Yeah. But yeah, all the people walking by and weren't inconvenienced because we had a ton of junk just sitting out there. But it's, yeah, that was the first experience. And then you're like, I don't know that I'll ever go to a mall again. Just, just from being at BWI. Yeah, yeah. So it was funny to watch you go through that, like just doing seven days and then being around people in, in McDonald's that were in their Sunday best. Yeah, it was just like, I don't know. It was like... Uh, I don't know. It was only seven days, but it was just that, and it really wasn't, I wasn't off put by the people. It was just, I didn't want to be around people. Right. 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 Just like yeah. I just spent seven days away from society and now everyone yep. here is just you know, talking and loud and in their phones. I'm just like, get this is fucking a lot. Can we, it put, it puts it in wild perspective, dude. When you see 100%. how much people use their phones and after not having one for seven days, then you're right. like, they really are. You know, I, that's the way I felt about cigarettes. That's how I quit smoking cigarettes mm -hmm. was, it was like, okay, I have my morning cigarette and then I go to work and then I'll work for a couple hours and then I'll have my cigarette and then I'll go back to work and then I'll have lunch and a cigarette. And then everything was like, all I'm doing is doing something so that I can have a cigarette in a couple hours. Yeah. And, and it, like when that happened in my head and I was like, dude, you're a slave to this thing. Everything you're, you're planning your entire day around your next cigarette. Yeah. And that was when I was like, okay, I'm done smoking cigarettes. Now I'll smoke vapes that are inside. Right. Kidding. Yeah. That's safer. Stupid. Yeah. yeah. Nobody knows what's in those. Right. So Mystery. that means that they can't be proven. They can't dangerous. kill you. Right. Yeah. Because nobody knows. All right. Well, I'm glad we went through that elk thing, and I'm glad that we have a uh, a good game plan for hunting yeah. elk. Yeah, this conversation has lit the fire again, and I think we should definitely seriously start planning an elk trip of some kind. Yes. And I think we should reach out to – VPA as well and be like, Hey, we're going to start applying for elk tags. But if you guys, if you just want, I just, I don't mind going just hike along to uh, pack the meat out. Like I don't, I don't need sure. to shoot. Yeah. I'll come learn, I'll come watch and learn for sure. Yeah. Cause that's definitely a world that we don't, I'm not, not an expert. In yeah. Any, no. And the more exposure I can get, that's how I learned a turkey hunt actually just was I, I, I spent half of a season just going along without a gun, just a vest and, and, and camoed up and just observing and listening and having conversations and talking and just watching everything unfold. Yeah. Yep. It's the best way to do it. I was listening to a podcast today. They were talking about anything you do in life. It's like, you want to be a successful business person. You hang out with successful business people. Yep. And I think the same thing's true with hunting. You want to be a successful hunter, hang out with some successful hunters. So I, th I I'm more interested in uh, getting an invite on a hunt 
to not hunt, but to actually just go and observe, yeah. especially like a mule. I would love to go do that for mule deer. Yeah. I've never been mule deer hunting. Let me come help pack, help pack out meat and uh, yeah. I'll, I'll learn stuff. I can rock. I got big ass legs and you can put weight on my back and I can carry it. So and no matter how much I hurt, I don't cry and complain. Facts. Unless, unless you're my wife. Yeah. Of course. That's what they're made for, right? That's right. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's all I got. I'm going to go make some content and then dinner. Nice. I'm cooking a backstrap and a tenderloin tonight. So hell yeah. Trying to empty out this freezer so I can refill it. Yeah. Please do. I found those. In the, I, I found them in the back. Didn't even know I had them. Oh, really? It's a nice surprise. That is a good surprise. I haven't had whitetail meat in a while, eight months. Yeah. Let you know how it Got is. Got a hankering. All right. All right, guys. Until next time. Listening.